Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails Common Ground, where every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we will feature conversations with social justice practitioners, change makers, and activists on how we can mobilize our daily actions to radically reimagine our democracy. I'm Malva Kajali, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between special guest and investigative reporter, Catherine Stewart, and renowned artist and filmmaker, Jamie Nairs, for a conversation on the religious rights rise to political power. Uh, I know this is a topic that's uh, on everyone's minds day to day uh, at this moment, so we're very excited to get a little informer here. Uh, we're also thrilled to have poet and activist Gabriel Ramirez here with us this afternoon, who will read to close today's program. This October also marks the Rails 20th anniversary, which kicked off in October 2000 with the philosophy of remaining free, independent, and accessible to all. And we're so lucky to be celebrating 20 years of conversations just like this one, with a conversation like this. Um, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsi, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of the unceded land and waters on which we stand. Finally, before we begin, uh, we'd like to take a minute to say that we also stand in solidarity with the uprisings that continue to unfold across the country following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAtee, James Scurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, Richard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells and Toyin Salau, and countless others, and acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability, and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Until that day, we will continue to support ongoing action in the struggle for racial justice. Before I introduce our illustrious guests, we invite you to join us for a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce our host, over the course of a five decade career, James Jamie Nairs has investigated, challenged, and expanded the boundaries of her multimedia practice, encompassing film, music, painting, photography, and performance to explore physicality, motion, and the unfolding of time. Nairs has been the subject of numerous solo exhibitions, including at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and a career-spanning retrospective at the Milwaukee Art Museum. And her work is included in several prominent public collections, including the Metropolitan, the uh, MoMA, um, the Whitney, and the Albright Knox Gallery in Buffalo, New York. A, sub a survey of her film and video works was presented in 2008 at Anthology Film Archives right here in New York. Um, Nares has lived and worked in New York since 74 and is represented by the Kazmin Gallery. Without further ado, Jamie, the floor is yours. Hi. Um, are, we on, are we introducing Catherine also? Or am I having the pleasure of introducing Catherine? That's a pleasure we thought we'd give to you. Well, thank you. Um, Catherine and I have known each other for many years, since the early 90s. Um, and we've lost touch and found each other and lost touch and found each other again. And um, we've been talking a lot recently, especially since her new book that you've all seen the cover of came out and it's really an astonishing book. It's so well researched and beautifully written and scary. <laughs> I, have, I have to say, I, well, we'll talk about the book later, but, but Kathy, uh, Catherine. You can call me Kathy. <laughs> Kathy. <laughs> Kathy uh, is a writer. She's uh, written for just about every publication you can think of including the New York Times. Um, you better fill me in there, uh, Kathy, the Washington Post, um, numerous other publications. Uh, she lives in Boston, has two children, and without further ado, not a very good introduction, Kathy, but it got something across. No, that was great. Thank you. It's really <laughs> thrilling to be here, and I'm so pleased to be in conversation with you, Jamie, and thanks to uh, Malvika and uh, everybody at Brooklyn Rail for providing this space for us. 
um, we should begin at the beginning, I think. And I would love to know how you first got into this subject. Um, you have been writing about the religious right for more than a decade, um, and you've been sounding the alarm since the Obama administration. How did it all start for you? Well, it really started in the sun-dappled school playgrounds of Santa Barbara. I was living there, as you know, um, in 2009 and learned that something called a Good News Club was coming to our daughter's public elementary school. Good News Clubs are designed to convert very little children in their earliest years of learning into a deeply fundamentalist form of evangelical Christianity and they target public schools, you know, not, not religious or private schools or not in churches or people's homes or any of the other, you know, many number of places that were all free to practice our faith, if any, they were in the public schools and they were coming to our public school. Um, and I was really astonished to learn that there were thousands of these clubs operating in public schools nationwide, targeting children who are too young to read with the message that they were gonna go to hell without Jesus in our community, I saw how these clubs confused little kids into thinking that their school supported a particular variety of religion, uh, a particular variety of the Christian religion, not a sort of pan-sectarianism, uh, even of Christ the Christian faith, a very deeply fundamentalist form, and how they were using, kids were using the sort of misinformation to target their peers for what I could only describe as faith-based bullying and bigotry. They would target their non-Christian peers or kids who attended the wrong kind of church and the like. And these clubs really seemed wildly inappropriate in a diverse public school environment. But at first I thought they were really a relic of the American past. I thought it was this weird thing that must be a relic of an earlier time. And it turns out I was really wrong about that. So I decided to learn more about the club um, and the, the organization behind it, which is called the Child Evangelism Fellowship. So I went to their national convention in Talladega, Alabama, I thought if they think they have a right to come to my kids' public school, I have a right to go to their national convention. Um, I attended Good News Clubs around the country. I went through one of their training programs to train to be a Good News Club teacher. And the more and more um, I learned about these clubs and the movement that they represented, the more alarmed uh, I became. I was really stunned by the movement's legal sophistication. Like, how do they get into public schools in the first place? Wasn't this forbidden by the constitutional principle of church-state separation, but I sort of learned, learned how they wormed their way around the establishment clause of the constitution, which is meant to ensure church-state separation through these sort of novel legal um, arguments. I learned um, more about the movement's coherence, its sophistication, its high level of strategic thinking. And so I, I published a book on that topic in 2012 but it was almost like I'd fallen down a rabbit hole <laughs> and couldn't get out, you know? I just kept digging deeper and deeper and researching and writing. And the more um, I learned, the more I realized that sort of attack on public schools was really just one small part of a much larger attack on America as a modern secular democracy. And um, the power worshipers is uh, the results of the decade of research in, in this area. It really seems like these guys are in it for the long haul in the same way that, that they have been for the courts. And um, I was appalled at how insidious the, the, the whole thing is. The, the Christian right, when I was young, I just remember them as being like kooks. Everyone thought they were kooks and there was no sense of, a, of any kind of threat that they posed. Um, I think the, it, there was the occasional scandal when someone like Jimmy Swaggart got <laughs> busted for visiting a prostitute or something. But um, aside from that, you didn't really hear from them, I, I guess, until the Reagan and Bush administrations. Um, I was appalled, Kathy, at how their attitude towards children, you know, the, aside from the get them young and you've, and you've got them for life kind of attitude, there's a quote here where this guy Dobson, who insists, um, you might be able to say more clearly who he is. 
um, he, he regards children as being naturally inclined towards rebellion, selfishness, dishonesty, aggression, exploitation, and greed. That's his um, definition of a child, it seems. And, and it's certainly taken root in these, um, in, the, in the way they think and the way they approach the kids in school. Um, but tell me, what is Christian nas Christian nationalism, the religious wrong? <laughs> well, why uh, does it matter? Why does it matter? Sure, well, Christian nationalism is basically the idea that the United States was founded as a so-called Christian nation and that our laws should be based on the Bible. And it's the idea that we've somehow moved away from this idea of America and we need to get back to that. And it matters because, as you mentioned earlier, you know, Christian nationalism is not on the fringes of American political life anymore. It's really at the center of power. It's the movement that brought Trump to power in 2016 and they're backing him in 2020. Um, they have the sort of, they've been investing for decades in all the features of modern campaign infrastructure, including data, media, messaging. They have the sort of vast turn out the vote machine. I think um, people really misunderstand the movement. As you mentioned, they think of them as, you know, fringe or they have these sort of extreme ideas, but what they have been for decades is really tactical, you know? Um, and we can talk a little bit more about the, how that works later, how their sort of get out the vote machine works. Um, I want to point out that the ideology of Christian nationalism is deeply anti-democratic because it says that the foundation of our government in the United States is in a particular religion and not, and they say that that's what makes us great rather than our democratic system of government or the fact that we live um, in an irreducibly pluralistic society but have managed to coexist, you know, imperfectly, uh, clearly, um, but we have, um, you know, other nations have been torn apart by, by sectarian divisions and ours have been our, you know, We've managed in many ways to assimilate, um, however imperfectly, very diverse people in a pluralist society. Um, and um, by feet, you know, focusing in investing on all those, you know, um, that get out the vote machine, uh, Christian nationalism has also become a device for mobilizing and often manipulating a large subsection of the public and persuading them to vote for the hyper conservative political candidates that the movement favors. I want to say something about what the movement isn't. Okay, it's it's not um, it's not a religion. Okay, it's a movement that's exploiting religion for political purposes. Um, it's also not just merely preoccupied with symbolism. A lot of people think, oh, they're the ones that want to put crosses on public land or um, things like that. But it's it's not merely about this expression of sincerely held beliefs in the public square. The thing that's really at stake in the rise of religious nationalism in the United States is not merely whether we're going to blur the line between uh, church and state in these sort of symbolic arenas or offend the feelings of an outgroup. I think that, that's at stake is the most fundamental organization of our political system. It's really about whether the United States is going to continue as a constitutional democracy and a pluralist society um, united by an idea of democratic public and, and, and aspiring to the ideals of equality or not. This is a movement that doesn't believe in equality. They don't believe in pluralism. So I, I think it's helpful when we're talking about the movement to distinguish between the leaders and the followers. Uh, and I did a lot of that in my book. I, I spoke to the rank and file and I also spoke to a lot of the uh, leadership. Now the foot soldiers might think that they're fighting for things like what they see as traditional marriage or a ban on abortion. But over time, the leaders of the movement and the strategists of the movement have sort of reframed these culture war issues in order to capture and control the votes of a large subsection of the American public. They know if you can get people to vote on one issue, like a single issue or two or three issues, you can control their vote. So they use issues like the abortion issue to solidify and maintain political power for themselves and their allies, and certainly to increase the flow of public money in their direction. And, and enact policies that are favorable to their um, plutocratic and most well-resourced funders. They've been incredibly successful at turning language around and using it in a different way, like the whole, 
way they've twisted the meaning of the separation of church and state into this idea of um, Jefferson implying that a wall should be built to protect them from government rather than the other way around. Could you say something about that? Sure. You know, the movement relies on sort of pseudo historians like uh, David Barton. He's a, a fellow I wrote about in my book. He's sort of um, a myth maker. He, um, he uh, has, has basically conceived of this idea of, you know, the separation of church and state as being uh, to not uh, from, uh, to not freedom uh, from religion, but freedom for religion. He talks about a one directional wall. And that's, if you read the work of the founders, it's absolutely not like that. They were really uh, aiming for a separation of religion and government in our society. Um, you know, he's sort of been fa uh, peddling this fake history since the early 1990s, but he tells the stories that the movement wants to hear. And the stories are you know, fundamentally false or misleading. He's actually been attacked um, his work has been attacked by a number of conservative Christian historians um, at, at Christian universities. Uh, they say, you know, he's really gone too far. One of his books uh, uh, was considered to be so erroneous that it was actually withdrawn by his religious publisher. It was the first time Thomas Nelson Publishing, it's the first time they'd ever withdrawn a book from publication. But, you know, that doesn't stop him or the movement leaders. These, these myths are really necessary to provide a cover for the great lie at the center of the movement, which is that our founders proudly uh, started uh, and explicitly created the world's first secular republic. Um, he, Barton's seriously involved in things like, well, he seems to be involved in just about everything. But <laughs> the, the Museum of the Bible is one of his babies. and. Um, it's really a gross kind of into I've never been there but you have and uh, beautiful uh, and they've got great food uh, it really <laughs> they do it's really interesting um, the Museum of the Bible was founded by uh, Steve Green of the Green family they're the family behind that Hobby Lobby decision um, they uh, they are the founders of Hobby, the Hobby Lobby Corporation and they invested, uh, at least, I mean, a huge amount of money, hundreds of millions of dollars in establishing the Museum of Bible in Washington, DC. Um, and it has been embroiled in a number of scandals over sourced, uh, sourcing of some of their artifacts, uh, over um, uh, a sort of promotion of a, of a certain idea of, about the Bible's role in history um, when you go through um, you know, I, I don't want to get into the specifics necessarily, but they're promoting a kind of um, Bartonian form of Christian nationalist history of the role of the Bible in our nation's founding and the role of Bible in, in various uh, events over the world. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. I, when I was researching the book, I read uh, Steve Green's um, book, you know, you know, his sort of biography about the founding of the Museum of the Bible and some other sort of initiatives that he and his family were involved in. And he mentioned three people who were really influential to him early in his career, uh, early in his um, Museum of the Bible initiative. Number one was David Barton. You know, he sort of spoke, you know, with, in glowing terms about David Barton. Another one was a, a sort of a pastor named John Stone Street. The third one is Ken Ham, who promoted the idea that the earth was founded. Um, 6,000 years ago. Okay, so I actually, since I'm at home, I have all of my, you know, research materials here. Here's a book co-written by Ken Ham and A. Charles Ware. I got this book. Uh, it's called Darwin's Plantation, Evolution's Racist Roots. And I picked up this book at the National Convention of the Child Evangelism Fellowship. Uh, Charles Ware was giving one of the keynote speeches. There were four, like, keynote speakers. And he was giving, he was one of them. So he's Remember, the Child Evangelism Fellowship is the organization behind Good News Clubs. And uh, the Child Evangelism Fellowship has also a warm relationship with Ken Ham. So these groups that are putting their clubs in public elementary schools have a close relationship with a fellow named Ken Ham, who started a group called Answers in Genesis that 
promotes the idea that the Earth is 6,000 years old. This kind of gives you a sense of the ecosystem that these folks are working in. I, wanna, I mean, it's kind of shocking. There are so many of these groups. They, they seem to just explode. And when one gets into trouble, they shut it down. <clears throat> a little bit like going bankrupt or something. Well, they don't tend to shut it down. I mean, that's the amazing thing. They keep on going. Yeah, in, in spite of the extremism of their ideology. You spent a lot of time going to conventions and meetings of a kind that um, might scare us away. Um, and like how you've been to a number of Trump rallies, I believe, and um, certainly more than anybody here right now, I'm sure. How do you survive that? Like, I, I feel like I want to take a shower after I've read your book in a way. It's, it's so, it's like this guy, I want to get this stuff off me. Um, but, but why do you think Donald Trump, he's, he seems like such an unlikely candidate for these people who call themselves devout Christians. Why do you think they support him in spite, you know, despite his glaring faults? Well, one reason for their support is transactional. Trump, I mean, when we're talking about the leaders of the movement, for them, a lot of, some of it is transactional. Trump is appointing judges that are favorable to their positions in the so-called culture wars. Um, uh, and uh, to date, he's actually appointed, I think he's had something like 210 of his nominees confirmed to the federal bench. Uh, you know, uh, also, you know, appeals, we're talking, you know, almost three Supremes, unfortunately. Um, so he's, he's appointing these judges that are favorable to their interests. Um, and, you know, he promised to appoint, you know, they want to end abortion rights final public money to religious schools and other organizations and enact the kind of far right economic policies. This is a big thing. Far right economic policies that are favorable to the many of the movement's most plutocratic funders, like, you know, policies that, uh, you know, uh, ensure minimal regulation of government and business, uh, minimal, minimal regulation, uh, minimal or no environmental regulations and things like that. So he's delivering on those promises. And, you know, I've been to a number of events such as like marches for life where Trump will stand up and say to the, the crowd, you know, I've given you everything you wanted and I actually think I'm giving you more. And they applaud and, you know, they're going to stand by him for that reason. But it actually goes deeper than the transactional. In fact, in my view, Trump's clear disdain for the rules is part of his appeal. He has this transparently amoral character which makes him the ideal leader of a religious nationalist state. I mean, Trump represents the lawlessness of the authoritarian. He sort of puts himself above the law. And he's therefore representative of the authoritarian impulses of a large number of his supporters who, as we mentioned, do not believe in equality or pluralism. They really believe in domination. And they have actually made that explicit by comparing him to biblical figures. I'm sure you've all read about how they call him King Cyrus, an imperfect ruler through um, an imperfect vessel through whom God chose to enact his will, right? I was um, astonished by the use of the word kingship that they use so much. I'm oh, not, it's all about kinging. It's not about democracy. Kinging. I mean, the thing about kings, they're not rulers of democracies. They're about, you know, they are the law unto themselves. You know, they, what they say goes. You know, so if you, you know, they, they don't want the nice guy who follows the rules. They want the guy, the tough guy who sort of br breaks the rules and twists arms as long as the arms belong to their enemy. But it, this sort of hits on the fact that it's a deeply anti-democratic movement. They have a way of, of um, getting the rules twisted around so they work on their behalf. Um, yeah. Uh, you'll probably be able to talk about that more later. I was fascinated by the, the, the kind of secret directive that a reporter stumbled on uh, that was the, that had the the kind of grand plan for their long term um, assault on our democracy and they called it the blitz which and, and you know the, the this movement is characterized by many as being a, an all white movement but I think the 
well, if you if you wanted to, you know, conjure um, favor with the neo Nazis and others, c calling your your program the Blitz is a good way to send a message. Yeah. But the, um, the racial politics um, of the moon seem much more complex than that. They actually are. I mean, the, the movement is often characterized as a white movement. And I think for a lot of the people in the rank and file, it is actually an implicitly, if not explicitly, uh, really, I would say more implicitly white movement. I think for them, it's part of a vision that involves recovering a nation that was once supposedly Christian and white. So it's a form of identity politics. And it ties the idea of America to a specific set of like religious and cultural identities um, that are somehow approved, whereas others aren't. But, um, um, and I think obviously Donald Trump, um, you know, wins election, uh, won the election by appealing to the racism of a lot of his supporters uh, very openly. But leaders of the movement understand that the, the electoral future of the movement is not ethnically homogenous. They've really made in recent years a huge effort to reach out to conservative Latino and black pastors and other figures in communities are doing a lot of messaging uh, to uh, people of color, particularly in swing districts. But you know, they're doing a certain kind of messaging. It's always this idea of you know, religion is always sort of baked into it. And there's this irony that they're being enlisted. You know, these black pastors and Latino pastors are being enlisted to fight the culture wars that drive support for a political party that has made race-based voter suppression and gerrymandering a strategic imperative. And these you know, leaders of the movement tend to paper, or paper over the ways in which hyper-conservative religion and racism can reinforce one another. Um, I've been in conversation with um, some black pastors who've been uh, drawn into these types of initiatives. And you know, the, the talking point that they're given is that you know, racism is sin, is sin and the only solution to sin is uh, the Bible and faith in Jesus. Well, it's a complete unwillingness to tackle stru structural racism or even acknowledge that it exists. It's, uh, it's pretty clear that this is also a very patriarchal movement. And um, there are instances of that all over the place. Um, how, is, how, how important is patriarchy to the way the movement operates. And it, like, uh, as an aside, Kathy, what's it like for you going into these places as a female Jewish reporter? Um, tell us about it. Well, uh, with the exception of a segment of the charismatic world and um, a movement called the you know, New Apostolic Reformation, which um, has women in leadership positions the movement has normalized the idea of patriarchy at home and in church. Um, one of the figures I wrote about uh, in my book uh, is named Ralph Drollinger. He has taught Bible study uh, classes tar um, targeting political leaders at the highest centers of power, highest levels of political power, including as many as 12 out of 15 of Trump's current and former cabinet members. So he's an advocate ardent of male supremacy and female subordination at home and in church. You know, he got his graduate degree at a place called the Master's Seminary. It's a Southern California religious seminary. And um, it, it's led by a fellow named John MacArthur, who's been in the news recently because he's uh, one of the pastors sort of advocating against uh, limitations on the number of people who can attend church. He's advocating against these kinds of uh, public health measures to social distance, wear masks, et cetera. So MacArthur is an ardent supporter of these kinds of patriarchal ideas. And he expressed, expressed them really clearly in a sermon that um, you should look up. It's online. It's funny. It's called the will, which is funny. Ha -ha, the willful submission of the Christian wife. I mean, uh, last I checked, it was, it was up. Um, and it's really, he says women, Christian women should rank themselves under their husbands. I mean, this sort of... Um, this idea, this sort of normalization of patriarchy uh, at home and at church is actually much more widespread than a lot of people uh, outside of the movement realize. 
And it's also even you can find it if you dig into the documents, even within a lot of the so called hipster churches, the ones that are occupying public schools on Sundays where you have pastors and sneakers and jeans and you know they've got like kind of cool music and stuff like you dig into their documents often often you'll find what they call comp complement complementarianism and advocation uh, advoc you know advoc um they promote complementarian relations of the genders which end up being female subordination male domination um they have sort of very sort of um i would say specious language to try to justify this but um this is really what they're advocating for. Now, you know, I, I spoke to a fellow when I was researching my book who worked at the Master's Seminary for 24 years, and he said, he said to me, like, he, he did multiple jobs at the Master's Seminary, including running their um, library for a time. He said he was discouraged from purchasing books by female authors. And he said, if your wife, wife worked, MacArthur would fire you, or if he liked you, he'd give you a raise so she could stay at home. So, you know, not every sector of the movement is so extreme, but, you know, again, most of the conservative churches today that drive support for this movement um, uh, at, inc incorporate, um, you know, that kind of language in their founding documents. Um, this guy, Barton, is an interesting character, but he started off as an artist, as a filmmaker. Am I right? You know, David Barton was actually starting, he started off as a math teacher and then a school principal at, a, a, in Alito, Texas, at a school that his parents founded, a sort of Christian school. So he's always been involved in education and he's very intensely focused on public education. But I also call him the Where's Waldo of the movement because he sits on the boards of so many of its initiatives, like a data initiative. He's been involved in taking political leaders uh, to uh, on tours of the nation's capital to sort of indoctrinate them in the correct talking points of America's so-called Christian founding. He's sort of everywhere. And you mentioned earlier Project Blitz, which is actually a legislative initiative. It's, it's not really an overarching initiative for the movement, but it's a broad legislative initiative that aimed to flood multiple states with um, coordinated simultaneous bills in order uh, that some number of them would sort of get through and become law. And there was actually, there is literally a Project Blitz playbook. And I, I write about that in my book. And, you know, um, there's, uh, sorry, go on. It's been quite successful. They've, um, they've made some inroads. They certainly have. Um, a lot of it is on the so-called symbolic issues, like putting in God we trust signs in every public school building, and then maybe in every classroom, then all of a sudden you got God and God we trust signs on police cars. And the idea is that, you know, the architects of the Blitz know that, you know, they, they want to sort of push states down a slippery slope to, toward a more biblically based society. Uh, and they know that, you know, look, these initiatives won't turn every American citizen into an evangelical Christian. But what they do is promote the idea that they're um, the perception, misperception that there is a sort of so-called correct religion, one with a stamp of the state approval, one that's in our courthouses, in our public schools, and then a sort of wrong religious viewpoint, which is everyone else, everything they, else. They, they claim that they don't have to follow the laws if they're not the laws of God, correct? Well, a lot of the movement leaders um, are seeking efforts to um, get around the laws that apply to the rest of us through the idea of so-called religious freedom. Um, true religious freedom is, of course, the freedom of thought, worship, and conscience. It's the right to uh, worship any god or, or none if you don't want to. Um, and it's also the right, in, right to worship freely is as you choose and, it's, and, and to support any religious organization that you want to. It's also the freedom from having to worship any, any uh, or, or participate in any religion if you don't want to, and the freedom from having to support with your money any religious organization that if, if you don't want to do that. You know, that's why we have the separation of church and state, separation of religion and government. But in the, um, you know, in, in the hands of these uh, religious nationalists, they're promoting an idea of religious freedom that would exempt them from the laws that, um, that require, you require, you know, that apply to everyone else and apply to us. And of course, you know, included in that is a 
is a license to discriminate against people whose viewpoint or um, you know or, or very being uh, offends them. What are the um, the movement's policy objectives? Would you say? Um, their policy objectives include, you know, all of the, you know, favorable positions and the, you know, uh, laws that uh, favor their positions in the so-called culture wars, of course, um, like, uh, you know, uh, anti-LGBT equality, um, limited access to uh, reproductive um, technologies and the like. But I think to a people don't realize that the movement has long been allied with the sort of libertarian far-right economic wing of the Republican Party. So it includes um, economic policies that would uh, solidify the and intensify, you know, uh, grow the, the fortunes of their plutocratic funders. They're really after a lot more power for themselves and their networks and for the political leaders that they support. Um, they're, you know, after economic policies that are, look, we're living today with in record levels of economic inequality. You know, we, we have a winner, sort of seems like in some ways a winner-take-all economy. Um, you know, I was recently at um, a Valley's Voter Summit with, um, it's all online this year, and I heard Franklin Graham speak, and he's one of the religious right leaders, and he said, we are nostalgic for a time of the 1950s and early 1960s. And, you know, we're, we're nostalgic for that time period. And, and Donald Trump is nostalgic for that time period, too. And, and that's why we support him. Now, let's just, setting aside the legalized discrimination, all that garbage, let's think about what else is happening in the 1950s. Back in the 1950s, the average CEO made 20 times what the average worker made. So that's would offer them a pretty good lifestyle, right? Well, today the average CEO of a standard and poor, you know, 500 company makes 300, over 360 times the average amount of the American worker. So we're, lead, you know, dealing with like, you know, massive inequalities here. And, but, you know, the, the religious right claims to defend the American family and stand up for the American family, but they're actually um, promoting economic policies and endorsing economic policies that make it really hard for a lot of families to succeed. Uh, we've talked about their fixation on particular topics to thrill their people, you know, home. Um, and of course, something that is meaningful to myself, the, the, their fixation on trans issues. Um, I'm sure that people like myself uh, are considered an, an abomination to them. Um, <laughs> I'm well, they're, they're really fixated on trans issues. I remember at a Values Voter Conference a Summit a few years ago, every single speaker got up and said, we've got to talk about transgender bathrooms. And I'm thinking, what? Like, it was really hard to kind of understand what this fixation was about. And I've thought about it a lot. And I really think it's about there's the movement is really has all these gender anxieties. They're incredibly anxious about the gender hierarchy, gender order. And, um, and it, it, a lot of it has to do with, you know, with hierarchy and movement leaders, just uh, a lot of it has to do with, frankly, the, the role of women. Movement leaders have a high degree of anxiety about the stability of marriages uh, and the stability of gender relations about order and authority and lines of authority and lines of sort of, you know, uh, domination and submission. And by and large, they believe that the key to maintaining stability is to have these clear and enforced rules, a division, a strict division of labor, uh, a, a very strictly binary approach. Um, you know, let's remember that the movement has really, for a very long time, conflated um, a reactionary understanding of the Christian religion with the patriarchal idea of masculinity, militarism, and anything that threatens to undermine this is seen as a threat. So, you know, um, to them, they see an acceptance of, of trans identity uh, and gender fluidity as secular lib liberalism and what they call radical, radical feminism. And the idea uh, in their minds is that this is gonna destroy the gender hierarchy which um, is um, 
they see as uh, essential to a stable society, but also uh, uh, an affront to their idea of strict biblical literalism. The, the fear that I feel from that, although it's minor, is really um, not flat on its back by the knowledge that kids these days are so smart and so open to their friends and peers who are, are different. And without hesitation, without really thinking about it, they accept people in a way that is astonishing and wonderful. I, I know they're able to, to get to other kids when they're very young and twist their minds, but there's a strong uh, way of life that that kind of can tamp down my fears of what they might do or could do if they came to any larger kind of power. Uh, but you know, they've they've had successes already with you know they're they're constantly stabbing away at the uh, trans issues. Um, you've written that some of their successes have been really stunning. And um, tell me what, what's Trump given them so far? Um, the courts, number one, I think about nearly 25% of the federal judiciary is occupied now by a Trump uh, nomination. All of these uh, people that he's nominating, or, or, or the vast, you know, overwhelming majority of them are, um, you know, Federalist Society uh, people who've been groomed and sort of received the stamp of approval of the Federalist Society, which is an organ, a sort of right wing organization that has plays an, plays an incredible role. I think uh, the movement gets a lot of its gains in our society through the courts. It's funny, when I started researching this movement during the Obama years, people were like, what are you talking about? I'm like, no, they're they're making they're winning all these supreme these uh, lower court uh, lower court cases and and making some supreme court uh, wins, all of which sort of degrade the separation of church and state. So the courts, obviously, then he's also appointed to top cabinet positions. Figures like Betsy DeVos, who is um, has a long is a long has long history of activism. Uh, in attempting to degrade public education, and Alex Azar, who was secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, established a conscience and religious freedom division, which is designed to let healthcare workers deny um, certain services to patients as a matter of religious conscience. So, you know, Trump's cabinet also support um, policies that funnel taxpayer money to conservative religious organizations that support him. I mean, he's given the movement leaders unprecedented access and power. So he's giving them, indeed, everything they want. They have those prayer breakfasts and, and capital prayer sessions. In, they're trying to get some kind of prayer session going in all the state capitals. And they've been pretty successful in that so far, too, mm -hmm. to sort of insinuate themselves um, as far as they can up the ladder of power. Yeah, it's a conflation of the idea of America with a very specific religious viewpoint. Here's something that I, you know, we just need to make really clear. This isn't Christianity. Most American Christians reject the politics of conquest and division that this movement represents. It has long, it is a very, you know, Christianity is extraordinarily diverse. You know, I have a friend who contributed to a book called The Handbook of Christian Denominations. They're, they identify just a huge variety and complexity and, and sort of brilliant mosaic of Christian viewpoints. But, um, you know, the movement has long set itself in opposition to progressive Christianity, uh, acceptance of the social gospel, and other forms of the faith that I think are really widely accepted in our society. So it's really a kind of extreme and which, you know, one used to call fundamentalist. Um, but it also includes both 
you know, here's another thing. It's not, it's not just about evangelicals. It, the movement includes many evangelicals, but it also, also excludes many evangelicals. And it includes representatives of a variety of both Protestant and non-Protestant religion, including uh, conservative, some conser hyper-conservative Catholics, uh, uh, a segment of the Pentecostal and charismatic world. And the movement also gets support from some people who actually don't even identify as Christian at all. So it's really a political movement that's, uh, you know, exploiting religion for political purposes. Um, you mentioned the um, Christian nationalist legislative initiatives and um, help me understand their history and role and impact. Are they um, groups that lobby for specific legislation? <laughs> do they write legislation or do they just propose it to um, particular members of Congress to do it for them? That Project Blitz initiative that uh, we mentioned earlier, it, have you heard of like the American Legislative Exchange Council um, no. or ALEC? Okay, so, so groups like American Legislative Exchange Council or ALEC or groups like Americans United for Life craft and promote pieces of what they call model legislation. That is, they get together often with their corporate sponsors or their other sponsors and they write pieces of legislation and then similar you know, or identical pieces of legislation are adopted by um, politicians who are sympathetic to their agenda and they go out in multiple states. It kind of gets everybody with the same political vision on the same page. Um, uh, and Project Blitz operates the same way. They aim to flood multiple state legislatures with these sort of coordinated simultaneous bills. Um, and the, the, it's interesting, they divided the legislation into three categories according to anticipated level of difficulty. The first level was about the symbolic issues like in God we trust signs. Um, the second uh, phase was about, uh, was bills that pr proposed to inject sort of Christian nationalist ideas more directly in schools and other government entities like proposing a sort of Christian Heritage Week. And of course the heritage that they're gonna be teaching is a very particular version of Christian heritage, one whose talking points might have come directly from David Barton. But the point of phase two was really to make room for phase three, the sort of most profound level of uh, legislation which legalizes discrimination against LGBT Americans or others whose uh, actions are very being offends the sensibilities of uh, conservative Christians. They really want the ability to discriminate against those whose viewpoints they disagree with. And here's an interesting thing. There's a case that's going to be, uh, um, that's coming up um, involving, um, it, it's, it's located in Philadelphia and it involves discrimination against a Catholic person, an evangelical organization uh, excluding a Catholic person from uh, certain types of benefits. So it's, it's not just LGBT Americans. It could also include people of different religious viewpoints. It can include the non-religious. It can include unmarried women or, or um, couples who are living together and not married. I mean, it really could include everyone who is not um, a member of the sort of correct viewpoint. It, it really, you know, it, it's this idea that your religion trumps the law and it's kind of astonishing. I mean. They've got into the hospitals too. Uh, there's that ruling, I don't know, I forget the acronym, it's like a three-letter acronym that allows hospitals, I guess this is very good for the Catholic hospitals, to um, write a set of rules and prevent um, all kinds of um, surgeries and things or even attention being given to people who they prefer not to for religious grounds. Indeed, and that can be really dangerous if you're a woman and experiencing trouble in your pregnancy. The um, the the, the number of really are, are governed by something called the ethical and religious directives, which is a set of numbered laws that are come up uh, di directed by Catholic bishops, not by doctors, uh, allowing certain kinds of care and disallowing others, and also sort of guiding certain aspects of care. And you know, many of these directives are completely laudatory and 
uncontroversial, but they do prevent certain types of um, uh, care being uh, being delivered, and that can prove incredibly dangerous, and it's also very discriminatory. Tell me, where does the movement get its financing? Well, the movement has three sources of funding. The first is plutocratic donors, um, thinking about families like Steve Green's family or Beth, the DeVos Prince family or the Wilkes brothers or the Scaife family. I mean, there's a, um, a number of these uh, plutocratic donors, many of them belonging to extended hyper-wealthy families. Um, uh, and many of them, by the way, are as committed to low taxation and a minimally regulated economy as they are to right-wing positions in the so-called culture wars. At the same time, uh, much of the movement's daily activity uh, from their policy organizations involves an effort to get small dollar donations from the rank and file through mailings and other appeals. I'm on the mailing list of like, you know, the Family Research Council and Students for Life and all those kinds of groups. I'm getting, you know, multiple requests every day for, you know, can you please chip in, I don't know, $5, $25. And it must work because <laughs> I'm sure I get a lot of those mailings. Um, and then there's also the third um, source of their funding, I think, is uh, public subsidies. And a lot of their activity is an attempt to secure or even increase public subsidies through various means. Um, you go into great detail about that in the book, and it's unnerving, I have to say. Um, I hate the way they've usurped the word family. There are all these family institutions and organizations that they put together as though we don't have families, that, that we don't know what a family well, we is. We do. <laughs> <laughs> we have families who we love and want to care for. Yeah, probably more than they seem to care for, for, for theirs. And, uh, you know, despite the love profess, I was really, really astonished also by um, that guy's list of, of ways to behave a, 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 a difficult child, ways to punish a, dif a difficult child, which, you know, the corporal punishment is big with them. You, you know what, Jamie, you're right. And it, this was the hardest part of my, you know, everything I wrote in my book was completely fact-checked. You know, I went through very extensive legal reads and everything had to be absolutely watertight. But there's a section in chapter, uh, chapter 12 where I describe the very ritualized corporal punishment that one of these, uh, uh, one of these pastors is advocating that people inflict on their own children. And it was this very ritualized, really disgusting form of um, physical abuse that he's, and it includes like specific, you know, these points, you gotta do this and you gotta do this and your child has to stand this way and you have to say this. It was. I felt re-traumatized every single time I had to, you know, every, every single part of my book, I, I wrote it and then I read it like 50 times as I'm, you know, um, editing the chapter and making sure the words are just right or fact checking and checking again. I felt re-traumatized every single time I had to go back and, and reread that section or reread his, his document where, where I um, reproduced it from. And oh. it was awful, but I gotta tell you, James, Jamie, I've um, also like heard so many times from people, you know, I get really interesting mail and I've heard from a number of people who are survivors of this movement, yeah. uh, kids who are raised in the movement, and many of them read that section of the book and said, I felt seen, I have dealt with that trauma. Um, it has stayed with me my entire life being subjected to that kind of ritualized corporal punishment or physical violence really. And um, well, I got a lot of that myself when I was at English public school. They would whip us on our bare bottoms with a birch rod. It fucking hurt. I, I, you know, and when he talks about, I mean, I guess there was a similar kind of ideology behind that too. He says, take them into the bathroom and make them bend over the sink and pull down their their trousers and oh, don't even say it you'll try it but it no. goes on there's like two yeah. pages of this it's stuff awful. it's awful it's, it's really sick 
I want to really stress the importance of demanding immediate obedience. I won't go on because it's unreadable. It's I know, and and I don't want to suggest that every you know parent in this movement is doing this, or that every leader advocates for it. But you know who does? Ralph Drollinger actually has. Uh, he's the guy who's the leader of Capital Ministries. He yeah. is targeting political leaders at the highest levels of power, including 12 out of 15 members of Trump's cabinet. He advocates for this type of corporal punishment. He says, I'm going to paraphrase here, a failure to be, you know, to do this to your children is, you know, you're going to have to answer to God when you, you know, when, when the question is, are you going to get to heaven? He's like, I mean, so he's advocating for it. Uh, James Dobson, who is the founder of Focus on the Family, one of the uh, major policy groups of the religious right, he advocates for um, that type of uh, punishment. Of, and, and he actually advocates for it in sort of like a kind of sick way, actually. <laughs> this sort of, um, and, 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 you know, when I was at, you know, researching the Good News Clubs, the Child Evangelism Fellowship, they, um, you know, there was an independent study of their five-year curriculum taught in every Good News Club from coast to coast. There was an incredible emphasis, thousands of references to sin, obedience, and hell, and only two or three glancing references to the golden rule or the royal law, loving your neighbor as yourself. So it's a very particular um, uh, interpretation of the Christian faith that was being taught there, uh, emphasizing obedience, punishment, and sin. I liked it. In, in the very beginning of the book, you're with a friend of yours called Peter or something, and you're, you've gone to some kind of event, and he's as baffled by you are, by the way, his religion has been, you know, taken away from him, it feels like. And he says that the Bible is inherently political because it, I forget how he says it, but it, it because it always comes down on the side of the, the dispossessed and the powerless being affected and helped by, the, by those with the power. Um, exactly, his interpretation is the exact opposite. He's saying, you know, the Bible protects the poor and undefended. It advocates that you love your neighbor as yourself. Um, it challenges power, the alliance of power with money. And in their version, in their interpretation, you know, the alliance of, of power with money is something to be lauded. And they say that it's actually, um, you know, demanded by their reading of the Bible. It, it, there's this guy, Rush Dumi. What a name. Is that his name? Rush Dumi, yeah. Rush Dumi. A lot of these people have perfect names for what they do. Mm -hmm. He is um, the inspiration for a lot of the other writers, subsequent writers. Am I right? Um, he, he has a, a real, he's a sort of openly theocratic Christian uh, reconstructionist. He's known as the godfather of that movement. And while a lot of the political leaders today uh, and, and religious leaders don't sort of cite him openly, little bits and pieces of his theology are to be found absolutely everywhere. He was a real thought leader. I mean, the movement has a number of thought leaders, a uh, number of people who shaped it early on, but he was definitely one of them. And the main thing to know about him is that he was really hostile to the principle of equality. Um, he uh, endorsed a very austere biblical literalism, rigid hierarchies, which he said were ordained by God. I mean, this is stuff that we're hearing among movement leaders today. Like the movement leaders today, his theology included opposition to government assistance to the poor, opposition to public education. Um, he cast social welfare, welfare programs as what he called slavery to the state. So he shares a lot with those leaders today. Um, he was quoted uh, at length by David Barton. Um, he is actually uh, quoted uh, by an organization called Watchmen on the Wall. Okay, Watchmen on the Wall is one of the really interesting organizations of this movement. It's a, a, um, it was founded by an organization called the Family Research Council, which is one of the movement's most powerful policy groups. The so Watchmen on the Wall is a network of th tens of thousands of affiliated conservative pastors and movement leaders spend a lot of money and time giving them the tools that will um, tell them how to turn out their congregations to vote. They know that pastors drive votes. People trust their pastors. And so they give their, these pastors tools, including uh, voter guides, um, 
videos to show at church, instructions for how to form teams within their church of congregants will tell other congregants how to vote. And it's basically a, a means of getting all of these people coordinated on, on the same page when it comes to figuring out how to turn out their vote for um, right-wing pastors. So they quoted Rush Duties and uh, some of their written materials. And by the way, you know, Watchmen on the Wall is actually, um, if you look at their web website, they have endorsements by multiple Republican politicians, including Vice President Mike Pence. So this is not just some fly-by-night organization. I mean, they're really um, a key part of the movement's machinery for turning out the vote. The lists of, of people who attend their prayer meetings in, in the capital is pretty full. At, um, Secretary of State Pompeo, he's always there. OK, here's a question. How come the religious wrong, as I will now call them, how come it has so much power in such a diverse society as ours? Well, so members of the movement are still a minority of our population, but they're overrepresented um, when it comes to the vote because they're so organized and networked and disciplined. Um, they, I mean, one way to get a handle on the numbers of the movement is to look at the work of this evangelical pollster named George Barna. He's very embedded in the movement. And he says the most committed religious right voters and activists are disproportionately involved in the political process and they vote in extremely high numbers. So in uh, 20, uh, 2016, you know, they're only 10% of the population, just 10%. But in 2016, 91% turned out to vote and 93% of those to ca you know, cast their vote for Trump. So again, they're a minority of the population, but have disproportionate power because of their level of voter engagement. Um, now let's remember 40 to 50% of Americans do not vote. And a number have their votes disenfranchised, not because they don't necessarily want to, but a number have their votes disenfranchised through uh, voter suppression, the various kind of, of dirty tricks that we're st starting to see now. So I think it's really important to note that, you know, this disproportionate voter engagement is a tool that's in, available to all of us who reject the politics of conquest and division that this movement represents. This um, cohort that Bar Barna identifies as 10%, they're not just voting. They're holding their friends and family accountable to vote. They're knocking on doors or making phone calls and things like that. They're the ones who are the most engaged. But those vote, vote, um, tools are available to all of us you know, who reject the politics of division and conquest. I mean, they're using the tools of democratic political culture to end democracy, but you know, those same tools can be used to restore it. And lastly, I have a final question. How do they use the term religious freedom to disguise their true objectives? Could you say? Well, in the hands of movement leaders, the term religious freedom or religious liberty has really come to mean its opposite. It's become like an Orwellian term that means religious privilege. It's this idea that people who hold the so-called correct viewpoint should be permitted to discriminate against LGBT Americans and others whose characteristics um, offend them or offend their sincerely held religious beliefs. It, now this privileges, of course, certain viewpoints and certain religious viewpoints over others. If your commitment to equality and equal treatment under the law is rooted in your own sincerely held beliefs, your own sincerely held conscience, there is no liberty in this type of religious liberty for you. So I think that we really need to um, engage with the term religious freedom and affirm uh, its true meaning. And that there's no religious freedom unless it applies equally to all of us. Thanks, Kathy. Maybe we should open it up to some questions at this point. Thank you to the both of you. Um, this has been a beautiful conversation. Um, a I don't know if you've been following, but the chat has been on fire. Uh, we're just all in awe. I feel like we're getting all the answers that we've been like waiting for for um, and this, uh, I just want to repeat this line that you just said about using the tools of democratic political culture as the alt-right does to end democracy but that in fact we can leverage those same tools 
to restore it um, that is really resonating with me in these uh, weeks and months. Um, so thank you for that. Our first question will come from the lovely Darla Migan. Darla, you can turn on your microphone now. There we go. Hi, I can turn on my camera as well. Your choice. Hi. Oh, so much to take in here. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm wondering about the genealogy between Nixon, Reagan, and Trump, and where we might insert Sarah Palin as a mother and leader of the Tea Party. And, and I really appreciated your presentation because of the way that you were introduced as a mother. And I wonder if there, and then especially the, the moment where you talked about the way that um, the topic of transgender people comes up as a way to regulate the hierarchy of gender. And so I, see, I don't know, I'm hoping, seeing some, um, some way to have hope here in the, con in the context um, of a resistance among mothers, perhaps. Um, just curious about your thoughts on the role of mothers and gender in this fight. Oh, wow. So thank you so much for listening and thank you so much for bringing up all of these really important issues. Um, I want to speak to to two of them. The first um, having to do with Reagan. It's really interesting. I, I think we have to look back a little bit to the rise of a movement called the, they called themselves the New Right. It's a sort of predecessor of today's religious right. They were really unhappy with it. We're talking in the like 1970s and and uh, early 1980s, they were really unhappy. It was a collection of activists like Paul Weirich and Howard Phillips, uh, Jerry Fowler was involved, uh, Phyllis Schlafly. They were really unhappy with the direction of the Republican Party at that time. And they were also unhappy with the trend toward liberal religion, a more religious, uh, uh, liberal and, and social justice oriented um, uh, trend of the, of the Christian faith. And they really wanted to kind of ignite a hyper-conservative counter-revolution and so they were looking for issues to unite their movement. Um, they were really, uh, the biggest issue for them was, by the way, what they considered the unfair tax treatment of racist academies, um, schools like Bob Jones um, and other schools that were affiliated with Southern um, pa pastors. The IRS was starting to look askance at them and saying, why are we giving you these tax privileges? But they knew that this wasn't going to be an issue that would effectively unite their movement. So they were looking at some other issues. How, what would be an attractive issue for us? What would sort of be an issue could kind of go out with? And that, so there was that, the schools, they were looking upset about the women's movement, which was threatening to upend the gender order, but the ERA at the time was kind of going down in flames anyway. And when they got to the abortion issue, they sort of, you know, it was sort of like a light bulb went off. And they're like, wow, this could actually work. And it was, so what they did was they united, I'm gonna to get to Reagan in a second. They united around the issue of, um, you know, this was an issue that they felt like could unite conservative Protestants um, and fundamentalists with um, conservative Catholics and create a sort of coalition, a broad coalition to challenge some of the, what they perceived as liberalism of the current Republican party at that time. So there's an instance, so this brings us to Reagan a number of those leaders of the new right and figures who were involved in it were in, um, uh, in attendance when Ronald Reagan gave this historic speech at the Reunion Arena 1980 uh, in Texas. And he, there was a gathering of about 15,000 pastors, uh, just huge numbers. And he said to them, this was a gathering of conservative pastors that were all sort of on board with sort of um, a kind of conservatism rather than a more sort of liberal understanding of the faith. And he said, I know you can't endorse me, but I am endorsing you and what you are doing. And the pastors went absolutely wild. And the new right had kind of engaged a number of pastors through some of the big figures like Jerry Falwell and D. James Kennedy and these other very influential pastors who had radio programs to try and get them to re-engage in the, in the public square and re-engage in politics. And this is kind of a key moment that 
um, signaled a kind of igniting of a kind of that sort of hyper-conservative counter-revolution. And so we're seeing the consequences of that today. So that's a really long answer, and I hope uh, it gets to one part of that question. But it shows the sort of how Reagan, even though he had passed the most uh, liberal uh, abortion legislation in the country in, I, I think it was 1967, he was kind of on board at that moment with this sort of hyper-conservative counter-revolution, but he signaled it in a kind of gentle way. Was that Nixon? No, that was Reagan at that time. Okay. Um, uh, but um, going back to your question about mothers, I mean, it's amazing. You know, the, the movement claims to stand for families, but they treat families that don't look like theirs with contempt. I mean, look what they're doing in the public schools, going after other people's children, you know, showing absolutely no respect for the integrity of, of other people's families. So, um, I don't know, one can hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you. I'm so grateful to you. I, I don't know if that answers your questions, but. Yeah, I mean, it, it just speaks to the, the, uh, the level of contradiction um, that they make avail themselves of, which is, you know, condition uh, condition of ideology. So you, you have to, you know, put the blinders on and get to the goals that you need to get to regardless of what it takes to get there. Indeed. I think it's, you know, for them a, a war of conquest and they've expressed that many times in a lot of their written materials. They were also handed a couple of issues on a plate around the same time um, and particularly of interest to our world. Um, do you remember the Maplethorpe um, mm -hmm. controversy, mm -hmm. controversy, when um, that became a huge cause to them? I think what year that was, but I think it was shortly after Reagan came in. I can't remember the guy. Do you remember the name of the person who? Jesse Holmes, yeah. Jesse Helms, thank you. Yeah. Jesse Helms, he was terrible. That was a um, that was like a, a a real win for them when they demolished his standing. They, they had to close that show, I think. And the NEA suffered, and we suffered because of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, I'm really glad that like right off the bat, we got into the sort of all pervasive figure of like the family and the mother and the child and the way it like is, is so injurious um, that, that it needs to be leveraged at every moment. Um, our next question comes from my queer elder, Sheila Pepe. Sheila, you can turn on your microphone now. Hi. Um... Just, just a, just a response to Darla quickly, and then I'll ask my question. Um, Darla uh, Nixon was a Mormon, and so it's quite possible, which is outrageous if you think now that there would be any um, relatively new religion that would become a president. It's kind of unheard of, but it, because it's an American-made uh, religion, I think that was like okay. So. That's like a whole nother side thing on American and religious. So Catherine, I can't wait to get your book, first of all. Thanks so much. Um, and secondly, so this is a, a huge topic of mine because I'm an atheist Catholic and um, only became atheist through, through study, really, of the history. Of so some say uh, that the, the United States has, has grown more religions than any other country and that we, there's good stats to say that American adults are more religious than any other wealthy nation in the country. And so I would like to say to those people who don't remember the ending of uh, school, uh, um, prayer in public school, um, I, I remember that being something my mother was sad about, um, that the, the tolerance that you describe is much more the anomaly in our history than, than uh, it's, it's short history, but that this idea of 1960s baby boomer tolerance um, 
is an anomaly and that these folks are trying to realign um, themselves with a originist um, founder idea of a relationship between God and property and God and money, which is um, the Calvinist, um, it comes from Calvinist origins. Um, so I am, I'm curious about why you are so careful to not take a more critical view of religion in general um, and where atheists fall into the picture of this argument. Uh, and I would just say, I'm not interested in banning religion. I'm just interested in a, in a healthier ecosystem system where as, uh, like a, you know, like they put the wolves back in the parks out west and it's a healthier ecosystem. So if you put the atheists back into the ecosystem in a very visible way, what would happen to American religions? You know, that's, thank you so much for all the stuff you said. And I'm just going to go back to something you said about prayer in schools. Um, the reason we stopped teaching religion in public schools, you know, if you listen to the religious right, they say it, it all happens because of these two Supreme Court decisions in 1962 and 1963. Well, actually, um, the diminishing of the role of religion in public schools, you know, started a hundred years, more than a hundred years earlier. So even when public schools first started, there was a lot of disputes among the various um, Protestant denominations about whose religion was gonna dominate. And there were a lot of fights about it and they uh, ended up sort of agreeing on a kind of pan-sectarian Protestant, Protestant, uh, Protestantism, which um, they thought would you know, har cause no harm to any of the various sectarian divisions within Protestantism. But when Catholics started to immigrate into America in large numbers, all hell broke loose. I mean, um, in Philadelphia in the 1840s, on two, uh, I believe it was like two, two separate weekends, people fought in the streets over the Bible in schools. Protestants were prohibited, uh, children were prohibited from reading it from their version of the Bible. Uh, public school textbooks at the time were filled with anti-Catholic bigotry, horrible things against the Pope, and dozens of people died in street battles in Philadelphia over Bible. It was called, you know, the Bible Wars. And then there were the Cincinnati Bible Wars. The same kind of thing happened in Cincinnati and the same kind of thing happened in Boston and Maine. And um, all of this caused so much division that um, uh, President Ulysses Grant gave a speech and he, he said, you know, keep the, I'm gonna um, butcher this quote here. <laughs> he said something like, keep the matter of religion to the hearth and the church and the private sphere, keep the public schools non-sectarian, let's keep church and state forever separate. Um, and then, you know, over time with the, uh, larger uh, in other immigrant groups coming in, the role of teaching of religion in public schools sort of thinned out and diminished. Um, so by the time we reached the 40s, there were actually a pair of Supreme Court decisions that further separated government and public schools. Yeah. And so those 1960s decisions were really just kind of um, a continuation of a, of a long-term trend because People recognize that in a society as irreducibly pluralistic as ours, the insertion of a particular religious viewpoint in a resource that is supposed to be common to us all, like the public schools, is inherently divisive. And, you know, if our public schools are to serve effectively in a diverse society, we don't need to be igniting these needless religious wars in our public schools. And I feel the same way. Um, going back to what you said about, you know, um, the, you know, um, so, so I would just argue that that was a way to protect Christianity, not put it, subject it to exterior influences because, you know, at that time and to this very day, the KKK is still, um, inside of various power structures and now, uh, you know, uh, obviously, semi-supported or a version of it semi-supported by the president and that's the institution that you can historically track because it's white it's it's it, it has a family structure and it's um always been against catholic against jews and obviously against black so it's about 
a time when all of these things were seen as races and not necessarily religions. And so I, I guess my argument is that the United States has always been like, uh, like Persia, uh, a religious state in the way that Persia was Zo Zoroastrian and gave way to, you know, I'm like, that's your, that's your Cyrus, isn't it? That you quoted? Um, yeah, yeah, although they don't, I, I, I actually, I think a, a lot of Persians really object to that idea of, of Cyrus, so. <laughs> I know. Well, old, old, old Cyrus, maybe Persian and Zoroastrian at the time. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I would say it's a, it's, you describe one hopeful trajectory, and I feel like the narratives that I read are about wiggling around tolerance to preserve um, power, white power, white male power, through a religion with a big boy god. <laughs> I don't know. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Um, our next question will come from our very own Henry, uh, who is a production assistant in our offices. Henry, you can, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much to the both of you for the very thoughtful conversation. Um, I, it's been very like uh, productive for me to like kind of pick apart the psychology and mythology of the religious right with you. And I wanted to bring up this book uh, indulgently that I've been reading um, called After the Future. I think it's backwards. After the Future by Franco Berardi. Um, and he mentions that um, different kind of groups, different viewpoints, uh, different communities place a kind of ideal time in different ways. And so um, the kind of uh, the liberal or like the um, intellectual kind of places uh, in a progressivist way places the ideal time in the future and tries to reform to get there. And then the religious uh, or the, at least the Christian uh, viewpoint is to place that in the past, in the time of like the Garden of Eden or the city of God and, and everything is uh, an effort to recuperate uh, the kind of the values of then or the, the way of life of then. Um, and so I'm interested in how much of a sense in the kind of mythology of the religious right that you've experienced, how much has been about that or if you've seen a kind of a sense of radicality as well in their rhetoric. And I mean, given how cavalier they're being with, um, you know, kind of democracy and, and they're being, I don't know, quite strategic about undermining uh, uh, like values that we, uh, that are, you know, um, not radical or, or are conservative in many ways. Um, and so, is there a sense of radicality to this you know, Christian movement? Of course, like liberation theology is a radical Christian movement. So right. if you could think, like say anything about that. That's a really great point. Um, I think one of our greatest impediments to this movement is the branding of it as conservative. A, a truly conservative movement would try to preserve institutions a value that have served us over time in our country. It would prize the legitimacy of the judiciary. It would prize and seek to defend uh, the legitimacy of voting, of the idea of representative government. It would uh, recognize and seek to preserve uh, public education, recognize the value of public education over time. I think that this is in fact a radical movement. It sort of um, has this myth of American founding that uh, is absolutely wrong. Um, you know, in this, in this weird time of COVID, I'm actually, you know, we're, we're homeschooling our, one of our youngest. And so I'm rereading the founding documents and Federalist number 10, the Federalist papers, and going all through all this stuff. I'm like, do they not, like, have they ever, they're always talking about America's founders. It's like they've never actually read America's founding documents. It's kind of astonishing. So um, even like the post office is guaranteed, uh, the, the, the perpetuation of the post office and, and that's sort of like guaranteed in our founding documents, a, a, a nationalized postal service. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's a radical movement and it um, wants to remake America 
in, in radical ways. But here's the funny thing about it. I, I use the term religious nationalism in the subtitle of my book because I want to make clear the um, movement's similarities with other forms of religious nationalism around the world. So if you look at um, leaders like Putin in Russia, or if you look at Erdogan in Turkey, um, or if you look at Orban in Hungary or Duda in Poland, when these leaders bind themselves to religious conservative movements in their countries in order to consolidate a more authoritarian form of political power, which I believe is a form of radicalism, they, um, you know, we recognize this as a form of religious nationalism. This is what authoritarian leaders do from, you know, um, Mussolini in, in, uh, in Italy, who made uh, Catholicism the state religion, or if you look at, um, or is it Salazar in Portugal? These authoritarian or would-be authoritarian leaders use and you know weaponize uh, conservative religious movements in their countries or strict religious movements in their countries and ally themselves with that type of clerical power. We rightly recognize that as religious nationalism. So I think that's what we're seeing today with Trump's alliances with their own sort of religious, uh, for lack of a better word, hyper-conservatives. In, in their radicality, do you think that they um, they have a strong sense of uh, critique, like that they have a thorough reason for radicality rather than just a kind of more passive, like conservatism? conservatism? You know, it's interesting. You can't always know what's in people's hearts, you know, especially when you're talking about a large collection of people. But I think for a lot of them, there's no, you know, they do believe that they truly have a mandate from God. And they also see how these types of um, alliances and this alliance in this movement that they're, uh, the their membership of the movement that they're um, a part of, they see how it benefits them personally, you know, their pocketbooks or their uh, amount of power that they hold. And I think for many of them, those two things are not necessarily in conflict. So it may be helping their pop pocketbooks and it may be, you know, and maybe giving them more power, but they also believe that they are in alignment with, with God's will. But of course, you know, there are some uh, leaders who, you know, in my you know, years of study appear, some of them is, appear to be a little more cynical than others. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. Um, the next question is going to come from yours truly. Um, I was wondering, uh, sort of bouncing off of this last response, like thinking globally, what are the best examples that we can look to? Like, I really appreciate that you located our kind of like counterparts of religious, like the rise of religious um, right, like sort of globally, right? And gave us like examples. And I'm wondering what are some counterparts, some intertexts in terms of like comparative global governments um, for this moment of instability in government, this rise of a fascist right wing, like religious faction, like what are the best historical examples or contemporary examples that we could look to in this moment to reflect or like give an indicator of how this political moment might play out? Um, I, I feel like you're the person to ask. I think I think we can look to our to our own history. I mean, you've had movements toward illiberalism in our history, deep movements toward illiberalism, and we've we've witnessed that illiberalism, uh, you know, in the institution of slavery and in the institution of segregation. We've uh, opposition to uh, LGBT equality, opposition to you know women's equality, and things like that, and. Um, and we've also had very strong movements toward liberalism and toward, um, you know, rational thought, toward um, expanded the idea of human rights and idea of equality, the idea of a truly representative government, which is what our founding documents actually, you look, as, as imperfect as those founders were, as imperfectly as it was applied, those principles of an equal society in which every person is, uh, has equal rights. These are ideals to aspire to. They have never been perfectly applied in our society, but these remain ideals that I believe we should aspire to. And the, to the extent that we seek to um, promote the uh, liberalism, the values of equality, representative government, the idea of a government that serves us all, um, is I think we sort of promote justice and the extent to which we you know, promote illiberalism or, or liberalism is strengthened, we promote uh, inj injustice and pain. So 
Uh, you know, it's interesting. In the last chapter of my book, I went to this uh, gathering of what they call the global conservative movement. I was, um, there's a, a gathering that takes place every year of leaders around the world who are committed to the sort of what they call defense of the family, but it's actually a vision of illiberalism. And they actually said, one of the speakers said, um, uh, declare war on, you know, we set ourselves against uh, liberalism, you know, liberalism and the elites, they call them elites, even though they have their own elites. They said, we're as, as global as globalism itself. And they said, please make liberal leaders and politicians fear you. Please make liberal leaders and politicians fear you. They're really after a vision, a sort of idea of power that is not based on equality, is not based on them. On all of that stuff. So, I don't know. It's, uh, it's one of the most interesting things I've ever done in my life was attending that event. It also took place in Verona, Italy. I mean, how could I not go? You know, you're going <laughs> to see some basically, you know, people with these sort of fascist ideologies and you have a really good plate of pasta. They themselves <laughs> probably would, would look even further back to the Crusades of the 13th and 14th century. And in fact, they do mention that and the, how they like singing songs like Onward Christian Soldiers. Am I right? Mm. In the book? <laughs> That's a long way back. That's <laughs> a long way back. Uh. Thank you so much. Um, our next question will come from Cal McKeever. I, I want to first say thank you, Catherine, for all your, your research and, and, and for this this book, I can't wait to read. And thank you, Jamie, for your, your, your warm and friendly guidance through this kind of horrifying conversation. <laughs> um, so I, this, this election looming around the corner, there's been a lot of talk. I've seen a lot of stuff on social media and in the news about, about um, Trump potentially not accepting the results of the election. And with the mail-in ballots and everything and the time frame being different than normal, it's going to be discussed a lot. And I'm just curious what 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 you think um, are the next steps for the left or the left um, in, in uh, anticipation of this, or if that were to happen, do you, what would your recommendations be for dealing with this problem? Sort of walk us through your thinking on like a day-to-day, -day, uh, by week, what that might look like. Thanks mind. for asking the question that's on everybody's mind, right? Um, I think that, um, you know, it's really important that not only that Trump is defeated, but also that he's defeated by such a landslide that they can't cast this as just a, you know, um, you know, they've, they've, that, that, that it answers definitively, um, not only that Trump has been defeated, but also the reason why a lot of Republican politicians have become so extreme and so far right is that they think that their alliance with the, this movement is going to give them absolute power. That's what's gonna get them elected. And so they, they adopt these absolutely extreme right-wing positions, certainly in uh, economic policy, uh, policy toward business and the environment and the so-called culture wars and the like. Um, so I think it needs to be an absolute, you, you know, I, I go to all these events. I went to this Evangelicals for Trump event recently, and there was a speaker there who said, don't just vote, become evangelists for the vote. You know, help, don't just vote yourself, hold members of your inner circle accountable to vote. Um, you can make phone calls at this point. I mean, there's a lot of ways to volunteer. Um, and don't assume, don't take, you know, don't assume just because you're in a blue state that your vote doesn't matter, it does. An absolute landslide would really help preserve our democracy and and help sort of Republican politicians disengage themselves from the far right wing of the Republican party. I mean, I think our government functions best when we have two functioning political parties that can, you know, engage in the, in the you know, politics of, you know, compromise and, and, and sharing of power. I do think that one of the reasons, you know, over time, unfortunately our policies have shifted to the far right precisely because of the involvement of this movement and the sort of far right, economic libertarian wing um, uh, as, and I think we need to sort of, you know, uh, make some adjustments and, and take some of that back and, and uh, have a government that works for all of the people uh, and not just uh, one that sort of privileges the ultra rich and, 
and we need to start addressing issues of like record e economic inequality. It's really destabilizing society uh, in every way. So I, I don't know if that helps. I got to say, Kathy, that um, just when I was beginning to beginning to give up hope, your final chapter, the epilogue, gives a a kind of bright light the possibilities of um, what other people are doing to combat the religious right and it's going on yeah we're seeing more organizing than we've seen certainly in 2016 uh, and um you know that we've seen quite some time i think that a lot of people just assumed the, the the election would go a different way in 2016 now they they're no longer thinking that way. I mean, I think there are things we can do as individuals, like vote and hold our members of our inner circle and friends and family accountable to vote. But there are things we can only really do when we join uh, together. Uh, in, in, and you know, the religious right has invested in all of the features of campaign infrastructure, you know, data, media, messaging, um, policy groups. Um, but these tools are available to all of us. Really. You were very interesting when we were talking a little while ago about, um, you know, how great it is to demonstrate and to get out there and make your voice heard. But you were saying that it's more important to get out the vote. It's, I think that, um, you know, without engagement in the political process in, in ways that actually win elections, you know, uh, demonstrations can be a, way, a great way for people to, um, you know, it's guaranteed in our constitution. It's also um, a, a, a great way for people to sort of um, understand the power that they hold. But we really need to get to the ballot box when, um, because without that, without voting, it, it, it really, you know, doesn't really matter. It's interesting. I was um, at one of these gatherings and Ralph Reed, who's one of the movement leaders said, pay no attention to the polls. Our numbers are shrinking. All that matters is who turns out on election day. And let's remember they won in 2016 in spite of their smaller numbers because more of them you know, turned out to vote. Um, well, of course, in a, you know, in a gerrymandered, you know, with a sort of imperfect you know, uh, system that we have, even though um, the other candidate won the popular vote, they were able to dominate in ways that swung the election. And so getting to the polls is really important. That should be in focus right now. I think that's a beautiful uh, place of transition. I feel like I want to also echo what my favorite representative from New York, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, said just a few weeks ago that uh, she gave everyone an assignment that there is one person, five people in your life who only you can get, who only you can reach in that way and that we should all be naming those five people and then like going out and getting them to the ballot box. Um, so maybe I would like to turn that over as our homework, you know, amongst ourselves, we'll keep each other accountable, everyone in the audience here, but we have one to five people that only we can reach and we have like a handful of days to get there. Um, so on that note, thank you both so much. This has been like prolifically enlightening. Um, our final comments will come from our very own publisher and captain of this fine vessel, Fong H. Bui. Fong, you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Thank you, Catherine. Hey, Fong. Hey, Amy. hey how are you? Good. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, beautiful conversation i i definitely only managed to read maybe quarter way through the book I got really busy Catherine, so forgive me but um i just want to mention that nixon was not a mormon he was a quaker so there's a huge difference between a quaker and mormon quaker believe in inner light of god whereas mormon is between god mediating with rosa smith that's a different right there but Going back further, Even I remember years dog. ago why I was preparing to interview Barbara Novak book, beautiful book, I highly recommend it. It's called Voyage of the Self. And I went back, believe it or not, I went back and reread um, 
the, the British colonial Christian theologian, Ek, uh, Jonathan Edwards, who you remember uh, was the one who led, led to the first awakening in 1730. Uh, in order to, to pair with uh, the, what are the first American art that was sent to in, uh, Europe to study, a train artist, John Singleton Copley. And I remember went back and read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You guys remember that? Famous, famous sermon. It's really about incredible explicit images and language that would awaken audience to horrific reality of hell. I mean, hell was the only condition that could be saved by Christ. And I think that was a very clear beginning. So if you are a good Christian on the surface, which then you are permitted to any kind of claim, if you dream of God last night that he told you you can kill and conquer so-and-so family and land, it will be okay. So that was very horrific discovery. But what I want to say, because... Um, Jamie was mentioned the, the, um, during the Cultural War with uh, Maple Thor's show in Cincinnati that Jesse Hems. Um, it's interestingly, we, we tend to forget too, uh, Lindsey Graham, who's with us today, uh, also from North Carolina, like the same way that Robert P. Griffin, another senator from Michigan before him, George Dondoro. You remember that name at all? You remember that name, Catherine? George Dandoro, who was the one who uh, censored and attacked American art during the 50 McCarthy period. No. You know, which is interesting because across, when the show at MoMA uh, that cre uh, organized by North Dorothy Miller, uh, some argue were funded by CIA in order to travel across Europe all the major cities from Rome to London, Paris, and Warsaw and whatnot, in order to illustrate the fantastical um, freedom of American expression. But at home, they were attacked. American abstract expressionists or New York school were being attacked by George Dandoro, a very famous case. And, and the, what, what I'm, I'm trying to figure it out, you know, when, our friend, our late friend, the beloved Jonas Makers, Jimmy. Mm. When he um, showed Jean Genet La Chien, La Chien, L'Amour, it's, I don't know, 20 something minutes long, remember? Yes. Of two homosexuals confess their love with such um, erotic beauty, separate by a war. And I remember that went to Supreme Court, 1964. And I remember Jonas have a very concrete evidence um, saying that it was demanded by the Republican senator that he must make copies so they can study over the weekend. <laughs> Let's uh, think of that for a minute. So it, it just come back again, you know, the idea, the feet of clay, you know? <laughs> the idea of the feet of clay is that you, everything that you, you believe is invested in the idea of reputing all form of authority, whether political or spiritual, none should be trusted. And those who are extremely authoritarian character who divide the world into us and them is also being preached that they are surrounded by our enemy are particular to be avoided. So yet they appeal to the same idea they aspire to. So that's where I think it's so interesting and complex in America. Uh, what is separate state and church. And I don't know political and religious division is that clear. And that's why it's so fragile. And that's why Trump at Cosmet say understood politics begin with the identification of the enemy. And I think that's why they embrace him so much. So anyway, thank you so much. I promise the power worshiper will be read over the winter with great, great, great pleasure. So thank you, Catherine. <laughs> thank you, Jenny. Thanks, Fong. Thanks, Ross. Thank Russ. you so much. Back to you, Mavika. Thank you, Fong. Um, I love this that we have, we have our designated reading now. Um, and I also want to shout out, we had a number of great questions that we couldn't get to from Lisa Don Gold, from Tom McGlynn, um, and from a few other people. Uh, I'm sorry, I wish we had 
all the time in the world, but I feel like we covered quite a bit in this in this one hour and some change. Uh, so without further ado. Will the chat disappear when you switch off or can I keep it and read it? I can send it to you. That'd be nice. Yeah, a nice memento. Yeah, we, yeah, we can send it and find a way to archive it. Um, so at the rail, we have a tradition of ending lunch with a poem. We've been uh, lucky enough to carry this out into our virtual Zoom events. And today I'm, wel I'm thrilled to welcome the poet and activist Gabriel Ramirez to the stage. Gabriel Ramirez is a queer Afro-Latinx Afro poet, activist, and teaching artist who has received fellowships from the Conversation Literary Arts Festival, Palm Beach Poetry Festival, The Watering Hole, Canto Mundo, and Callaloo. Big ups. Gabrielle has also graced a variety of stages on Broadway at the New Amsterdam Theater, at the UN, Lincoln Center, at the Apollo Theater, just a few blocks from where I am sitting currently, and other venues and universities across the globe. Uh, they've been featured in Huffington Post, Vibe Magazine, Blavity, Upworthy, The Flama, many others. And you can find his work at The Volta, Winter Tangerine, Was Good, Drunk in a Midnight Choir, Vinyl, as well as in the illustrious anthologies uh, Manteca, an anthology of Afro-Latino poetry, as well as Bettering American Poetry anthology. And um, he is forthcoming in What Saves Us, Poems of Empathy and Outrage in the Age of Trump. Um, uh, without, f without further ado, uh, Gabriel Ramirez, everyone. You should be able to turn on your microphone now. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's been a pleasure being able to listen to uh, Catherine and Jamie speak and be in conversation with each other. And the Q&A was just like, very good. <laughs> just a lot of energy. And um, I'm really thankful to like, just witness people be in conversation about things as sensitive and, you know, touchy as like politics and religion during these times. It's not anything I ever get to see or engage in. So thank you for this opportunity, uh, Brooklyn Rail and, uh, yeah, um, word. Abuelo, I couldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for you being dead. It was time for glitter, nail polish, and locks. Glitter in my nail polish, glitter in my locks. You wouldn't have loved me loving myself my joy rendered inconvenience, sucked teeth keeping me your grandson. My love for the men in our family is complicated, but still love, still me accepting who they are, how they may not accept me. Abuelo, show them the infinite possibilities tenderness allows, how the men in our family love women. I would love to be loved by me, and I would be afraid to be loved by me. I'd say enough to keep, but never do enough to stay. Afraid to die alone like Pops did. Others' love for me has been what's left after forgiveness. I could have loved them better if I loved myself less. There's nothing I could hide from you, Abuelo. You are no longer of your prejudices, and while I can still hold you accountable, I'd rather be held by your body of stars, your new understanding of life without the exhaustion of matter. Abuelo, mommy says I look like you, but I want to look like a man who learned to forgive himself. Orchids blooming up my throat. No man wants to sound like who's abandoned them. What song made us ask the wrong questions? What joke made us laugh, closing doors on our true selves? Who would relive the moments that shaped them into what they couldn't love? All my glitter and tenderness makes me the only mother I won't get a chance to mourn. I carry my bright child face and tell myself, you will become me. 
trust. Everyone dies on time. And um, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about my grandfather because of this conversation being raised in a Dominican Catholic household um, that was also unknowingly as a child anti-Black. Um, and then uh, to learn later in my life that my grandfather was an activist against Trujillo, who was uh, the president or dictator of the Dominican Republic. Um, and just thinking about how like, there, was, there, there, there were a lot of layers to my grandfather, right? And I was like, as much machismo and everything he was, he still had like a very solid heart for his family and for his people. And I would hope to imagine, and I'm also at the same time thankful that he doesn't have to be alive during these times. Um, and I would like to imagine that like he wouldn't bang with Trump. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's just me, you know what I mean? I would hope my grandpa would be like, talking crazy about him, how he talked about Yankees players when they didn't win the game, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, so um, yeah, this next poem. Um, yeah, I, I, I think uh, particularly during these times, I've, I've had to think a lot about um, how I grieve and how I heal. And, you know, um, going from, you know, being saved in like a, a hipster church, you know, uh, when I was like 18 and then being like, oh, y'all are sus, right? <laughs> like, like this is all cool and fun and we can mosh pit at the front of the church, but like, you know what I mean? We can mosh pit at the pulpit and dance and sing, but like, I see y'all messages and it's, it's not really all that cute. Um, and to now be leaning into more uh, African religions um, like Santaria and finding my home back where I feel like my spirit is seen and cared for. Um, where, you know, Christopher Columbus used Christianity as a tool to like, <laughs> to, to, to create genocide in the Caribbean and kill off all of the Tainos who are native and indigenous to Quisqueya, which is now the Dominican Republic. So um, this is all of those things in some way, in some part, all of me in one. So thank you again for having me and thank you for listening. Um, the Blooming. I am tired of yelling, of losing my voice to prove a point, to be heard, born, male, black, Dominican. I've been taught to take up space but no one ever told me that I could be a garden, could be soft and smell good and bloom at volumes people usually walk past. Usually lavender, mango, cocoa, or pink sugar oils are how people remember me, how the air becomes an antidote, becomes the search for the scent that filled our lungs with flowers with what reminds us we too can be a home for breathing and blossoming joy. And the heart hugs that follow, they require us to hug with the left sides of our body so that our hearts face each other while we all take a deep breath in and exhale together. Exhaling everything to try keeping us from being here in this hug this holy place that has no heaven except for the other person, for this intimacy is in no need of romance, in no need of a false future promise to one another, but the promise of this hug ending when we are both ready to release each other back into the world, back to sidewalks brimming with ghosts, and the promise of some danger, some gardens are unlike anything you ever seen, but you never asked what had to die for you to be this captivated. To be a garden is to take up space, hoping others will call you home. Call on rainy days too, days when clouds are all so you forget to look west, forget to thank light for its time, bright and generous now 
retreating into invisibility instead of staying where they feel unloved, where I will return. To be unloved is to have been loved incorrectly, loved enough to believe the lie of love being all I need, all of the failed gods in my stomach are dead and screaming for tenderness, screaming like my father, a garden ended at the root, at his bipolar, his depression, his alone. And I blame his absence for not letting me show him how to water himself into what heals. What kind of son am I to think? What is my father's isn't mine, isn't genetic. I carry his loneliness that isn't loneliness, but the choice to ignore the world. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Um, you're fabulous. I feel like we're all in this incantatory state. Um, and I think that's a really good reminder, a really good place to recenter that, you know, for many of us in the globe, uh, Christianity has always been a marginality and a fanaticism and come to us as the colonizer's language and religion. And, you know, that our profit on it really is that we know how to curse. Um, so thank you so much, Gabriel. And thank you to you, Catherine. Thank you, Jamie. Um, for so much rigor and wit. Uh, and thank you to everyone who is here today. Please join us again tomorrow when we will be joined by art critic, curator, artist, and educator, Robert Storr, in conversation with our very own publisher and artistic director, Fong H. Bui, for a conversation on Philip Gustav. Um, that will be as always at 1 p.m. right here in the Zoom. You can now turn on your microphones if you'd like and say goodbye as you leave. Um, it's been so lovely spending this time with you today and have a beautiful Thursday. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Catherine. Thank Thank you. You. Thanks, Catherine and Jamie. Gabriel. That was amazing. That was so beautiful, Gabriel. Gabriel, you are amazing. Thank you. I'm so happy you're a young child because we have a lot more of you to come. <laughs> beautiful reading, great poetry. Hey, Fong. Thank you, Catherine, for the beautiful book. I, I oh write God. once I read it this this winter break. Thank you, Jimmy, for being beautiful and talented as ever. <laughs> <laughs> I, thank I, you, I, Fong. And I thank you, Malika, for putting this together. Oh, Malika. great light. This is good light. This is terrific. Oh, so good. So, so effortlessly and gracefully and so oh, yeah. That's so sweet. It was such a privilege to meet you. I feel like I've been trying to hold off on like doing that, but this was like a wonderful roundabout way to like, you know, get to chat with you a little bit, get to chat with Catherine. Um, so glad we had this conversation. Yeah, keep up the love you guys and the good work. Thanks Marvika for being good, great, terrific MC. Let's Thank get some lunch and we carry on with our love and courage. Okay, you guys? Thank you, Fong. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Love. Love. Bye, everyone. Oh, much love. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.